The Lord be with you. And also with you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is love and endures forever. Welcome to Lebanon Christian Reformed Church. Uh, it's so great to be with you. My name is Sam Ashmore, and I work in campus ministries at Dort. So I'm thankful to be with you here in worship. I have a couple of, of announcements as we begin. One, Ethan Steenhook made profession of faith to the council. And on September 6th, he will be doing that before the church, so we get to celebrate that moment um, in Ethan's life. And also, the search committee is going to meet in the basement of the church after the service, and um, this let's be in prayer for that process as well um, for the search committee um, to act that the Lord would bring who we want to this place and to this church. And so we're going to begin in just silent prayer, just to... Uh, just to prepare our hearts um, to receive what the Lord has for us this morning. We'll be silent, and I believe we're going to go into a time of worship. time we're going to greet one another. Um, I don't know the rules of the church within COVID, so give some elbow bumps, give some fist bumps, wave from across the room, or take a minute and greet those around you.
yeah, we want to take a little bit of time, and um, one, I just want to pray um, for this church, for us, and so I'd love to, yeah, open it up for prayer requests um, that you guys have um, on behalf of the church and your families and, and what's happening, but would love to um, take some requests. So I guess, I don't know everyone's names, but I can definitely point. Uh, so any, any prayer requests that you guys have? It's always good to get a little rain in July. Anything else? They became great grandparents. Congratulations. I like the phrases. That's wonderful. Any Yes, that's a celebration. I have a grandson coming from London, Canada that called us in Durham University. Okay, great. So I worked there, it's a great place. <laughs>
good to be with you. As I said, my name is Sam Ashmore, and I work at Dort University, so I work in campus ministries there. I'm the campus pastor. And also, I just want to let you guys know that I'm from Texas. And so I'm, I'm probably going to say y'all a few times. I've said you guys a couple times already. It doesn't feel natural. It doesn't, but it's okay. So I might fix it up. But if I say y'all, forgive me. You should say y'all. It's a great word. You save time. Seriously, I think I've probably saved at least five hours of my life by saying y'all. Um, right? Each time. It's half a second. I don't know. But it's a, it's a great word. But I'm honored to be with you this morning. My wife and I were talking this morning. And it has been five months since we've been in corporate worship. Our church in Sioux Center has not yet opened up. Um, next Sunday is the first Sunday, and we're very, very excited to be back. And we've been watching on the TV and other things, as, as many of maybe you guys have been for a little while. But we are so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be in corporate worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you for inviting me uh, to, to open God's Word. And I know it's been a crazy few months for all of us. So I just I want to go to the Lord in prayer and just commit this word to him and that he would speak and that we would receive. So, Father, may you be glorified in this place. May you open our eyes to see who you are. May you open our ears to hear your word. And may you open our hearts to receive what you have for us. And may you be glorified. This is about you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have two sons, and they're really, they're really great. I have a three-year-old named, almost three-year-old named Zion, and then I have a one-year-old whose birthday is today. His one, his first birthday is today, Judah, July 26th. It's a great day. He's not here. He's been making much, a lot of noise. He's very, very happy and crazy and beautiful. But they like two things right now. My sons like mirrors, and they also like Play-Doh. Particularly Judah, the youngest one, crawls around. We have this mirror in our house, and then he always stops in front of it. He's like, just stares at it. And I mean, he's cute. If I was as cute as him, I'd stare at myself as well. But, right, he just stops, and usually he, like, slobbers on it and, like, bangs on it and gets really, really excited. My other son, Zion, loves Play-Doh. He loves to play with Play-Doh. And the extent of his Play-Doh cre creativity right now is he makes snakes. Right, so very easy. Big ones are mom and dad snakes, little ones are baby snakes. And then he makes pancakes, so which means he rolls it up into a ball, puts it on the table, and like bangs it as hard as he can until it's flat, and it's a pancake. That's the extent of his Play-Doh cre creativity right now. And, and Play-Doh is fun, but I, I asked myself, why, why do they like mirrors and why do they like Play-Doh? One, I think they, we, as humans, but also my kids, like themselves. But also, there's something about Play-Doh that you get to form and shape it to what you want. Right? We get to look at the Play-Doh and we can make anything we want based on what we feel, based on what we think, based on what we want to do. We form it and shape it how we want it. And while Play-Doh is innocent and fun, I think we can carry this principle maybe into our lives this morning as well. Because I think sometimes with God's word, with his scripture, we can mold and shape it to what we want it to say as opposed to what God actually says. Right? We, we, we can take it and put it in our box and in our mind as opposed to just believe what God's word says. And I think the problem when we do that is it actually causes us to miss who God actually is. And it causes us to miss his power and what God can do. And so this morning, I want to look at a group of people in Scripture, the Sadducees, who do this. Who mold and shape Scripture according to them as opposed to according to God. And the question I want to ask us is why did the Sadducees not know the Scripture nor the power of God? And we're going to answer this question based on Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to open there. I believe it'll be on the screen as well. I am reading from the ESV. I hope that's okay. I know some may have the NIV. But I really maybe want to make the question a little bit more personal. Is why, like the Sadducees, do me and you not know the scriptures nor the power of God? And, and I say that 
knowing that many of us in this room love the scriptures and we love God and we've seen him work and do great things. I read a little bit of the history of y'all's church. It has been, y'all, there you go, right? I've, I've read the history and I, it's a hundred plus years. And here's, here's the amazing thing I found about y'all's history is that when the tornado came through, whatever year that was, and basically knocked out the whole town of Lebanon uh, and, and the church, because it was during World War II, we weren't able to build another building, I think, for two years. Maybe some of you didn't. Maybe you all know this. But so you met, from my understanding, basically in the church basement that was still intact despite the tornado for a couple of years until you could build a new building. And so that, I just think that is a testament to the faithfulness of this church, the faithfulness to your parents or whoever was here during that time. And I know that we love the scriptures, but we as human beings are sinful and are fallible and mess up sometimes. And so my hope this morning is that we come to an even, even greater knowledge of the scriptures. And as a result, we are formed and shaped and molded to be even more the person of Jesus. So that, that's the hope, that's the desire. So I'm going to read for us Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 to 33. The same day Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him, Jesus, a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. This is the word of the Lord. So in this text, there are two parts. There is the question by the Sadducees and the response by Jesus. And for us to understand Jesus' response, we need to first set the scene a little bit, lay the foundation, and understand the Sadducees' question. And so first, the Sadducees, they were one of the main religious and political leaders of the time. And uh, they, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Right? That, that, they didn't hold to the Old Testament prophets or the Psalms or anything like that, only the first five books of the Bible. And as the text says, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And so they come to Jesus and they give this hypothetical, very unlikely situation. They say, okay, there's a woman and a man. They're married. Well, the man dies. Therefore, his brother marries the woman. Right? And, and this was based on a, a law in Deuteronomy chapter 25, Leverett Marriage. Okay, so this wasn't, it wasn't weird, it, right? We may think, whoa, that's kind of strange. But this was, there's a precedent in scripture for this to happen. And so they say, okay, so the brother marries the woman. Again, there are no kids. So this happens down to the seventh brother. And there are still no kids. The seventh brother dies, the woman dies. And they say, so who is the woman married to in the resurrection? And they think in their mind, we've stumped Jesus. That's their whole goal is to stump Jesus. To prove that Jesus is wrong. To prove that Jesus is not who he says he is. And they think they have concocted this great question that is going to stump Jesus. But it's important to realize, as I said, that this type of marriage, leveret marriage, was based on a law in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And the purpose of this law was to raise up seed. The purpose of the law was to produce offspring or children to continue the family line for the deceased brother. But here's the interesting thing. If the woman would have had kids by one of the brothers, 
Basically, when, when the family line continued, the man no longer had to treat the woman as a wife because the goal was simply to keep the family line going. And so in the Old Testament, marriage and leveret marriage were not the same thing. Marriage was instituted before sin entered the world by God to Adam and Eve, right, at creation. As leveret marriage was instituted after sin entered the world, and it was only instituted because of death, right? Because if somebody died, now this law has to enact, right? So it was not the same thing as marriage. It was totally different. And so the question is absurd. The question is hypothetical. And they're simply trying to stump Jesus. And most likely, a lot of scholars talk about how in Jesus' day, leveret marriage actually wasn't even practiced. It, it wasn't very common. And so again, they're bringing up something that's not practiced and that's totally misunderstood from Scripture. And so this sets the scene for us. This sets the scene for Jesus' response. And Jesus says this, you are wrong. You do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. And remember, these are the religious leaders of the day. And most likely, the Sadducees would have had the first five books of the Bible completely memorized. So, man, have you read Leviticus, let alone memorized Leviticus? But all the laws, all of those things, they would have had it memorized. So in their mind, they knew the scriptures. And Jesus looks at them and says, you do not know the scriptures, and you do not know the power of God. And so I want to bring us back to the question, why, like the Sadducees, do we not know the scriptures nor the power of God? Here, here's the first answer I want to propose to us this morning. Is we often mold and shape the scriptures to what we think rather than what God says. Sometimes we mold and shape the scriptures to what we think rather than what God says. Right? Jesus says you're wrong. But then he says this in verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now, it's important to clarify something a little bit. Sometimes this text is used to say there's no marriage in the future in heaven at all. Right? And, and this isn't a place for that debate, but I just all I want to say is that this is not the main purpose of the text. The main purpose of the text isn't to say there's no marriage in the future. What Jesus says, you will not be married nor given in marriage. Not that there will be no marriage. Plus, we will be married to the Lamb. There is a wedding feast upon entering heaven. So regardless, there is some form of marriage to Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth and in the resurrection. So I don't, I don't want to camp out there. I just want to say that's not the main purpose of the text. But the Sadducees are drawing a conclusion from the Bible, from Deuteronomy chapter 25. They're drawing a conclusion about the resurrection from a biblical text that doesn't talk about the resurrection. You catch that? The Sadducees are making a statement about the resurrection from a biblical text that does not talk. About the resurrection. They're taking scripture too far. Right? They're, they're reading their own viewpoint into it as opposed to what the text says. They are making it say what they want it to say. And really, what they're doing is they're bringing the resurrection on a creaturely level. Right? Jesus says, They're neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Jesus' point isn't that we're going to be angels in heaven. When we die, his point is that the resurrection is beyond our wildest imaginations. His point is we in this world, because we are so conditioned by sin and death and all of the things that we can't begin to grasp what the re resurrection actually entails. And so the Sadducees are bringing the resurrection onto a creaturely level because they're comparing it to leveret marriage, which was only instituted because of death. They are fitting Jesus and his word into their box that looks like them and is based on their thinking. I talked about Plato earlier, right, and how we can mold and shape and form that. I think we do that sometimes with people, too. I'll give, give an illustration of me and my wife. 
And sometimes I can be particular. This is, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of particular. Like, this is how the dishes go. This is how you should wash them. This is what takes place. And oftentimes I can become a little bit critical, right? And be honest with you, I can become critical, not just towards my wife, but towards anyone, if it's not done the way that I like, right? And, and the way that my wife washes the dishes, here's, here's the example. This is different. So my wife washes the dishes. She fills the whole sink with water. Right? Which most people do it this way. So I'm, I'm probably wrong here, but I'm right because I think I'm right. Um, right? She does that. What I do is I keep the water running because I, I just find it gross that there's like crumbs and things in that water and all the things. It's probably worse for the environment. So I confess my sin there to keep the water going. But I'm like, no, Gail, you're doing it wrong, right? I want her to be like me. Or not just that, I'm pretty passionate. Right now, I really enjoy good coffee. I don't put creamer in my coffee. I like getting good roasted, freshly roasted beans, I have my own grinder, and I want my wife to inherit my coffee hobby as opposed to put creamer that's like creme brulee flavored in her coffee, which ruins it, just so you know, just, it ruins it. But anyway, I want her to be like me, or sports teams, right? Basically, when Gail got married to me, like it was like, okay, you gotta love Jesus, number one, and be a Cowboys fan, number two, right? Dallas Cowboys. It was like, she needed to adopt the teams that I like. Any Vikings fans out here? Oh, I hope not. Sorry. Or Green Bay Packers. Even worse. Please, please. No, don't leave. God still loves you. He forgives you. Right? But this is what I quickly realized. That I wanted Gail to be like me as opposed to who she is. Right? I wanted Gail to both wanted to think, say, and do things like me as opposed to be who she actually is. I think sometimes we can do this with our kids. We force what we like onto them. They have to go into the family business. Not that those things are bad, right? Zion needs to love my sports teams or like football and not soccer, right? We, we sometimes do that to people. But I also think we do it with God's word in ways that we don't realize. Right? I want to I I say something a little bit. Okay, let's just receive this, right? Let's, let's not. But I think sometimes we try to fit Jesus and the Bible into a political party or an American box when Jesus wasn't a Republican or a Democrat, and we can know this for sure, he wasn't American, right? He was Jewish. He definitely was not an American, right? And we use verses from Scripture to disprove somebody's belief or to prove ours, and sometimes we wield Scripture as a weapon rather than the truth that it is. And, and, and this is why I say that, is, is look, our, this is a weird time in our world, right? One with the coronavirus, but I, you guys have, 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 most of you, have, I'm young, right? So you guys can give me wisdom on this, but from the time that I've been alive, I've never seen more polarization in our politics of right or left, Democrat, Republican, somewhere, libertarian, whatever, whatever we want to identify with. And what's happening is we as Christians are saying, you know what, you're being forced to choose. And if you choose this way, someone's going to tell you wrong. And if you choose this way, you're also like, there's no win. Right? It, it's a really tough deal. It's, it's hard to be a Christian. But here's what we're doing. We are fitting God, Jesus, and, his, and their word into a world operating system. We're trying to fit Jesus himself in the Bible into a world operating system. Remember when God was supposed to be king and Israel was like, no, we need a king. And God was like, well, you're asking for it. This isn't what I intended, but I'll give it to you because this is what you're asking. Remember, God is the one who reigns supreme, yet we are forced to fit him into a world operating system when his word and Jesus himself and we as Christians should exist in a kingdom operating system. It's this whole idea of how are we in the world but not of the world, right? It, it's tough, and I don't have the answer for us this morning. And can I just say, I think if we look at Jesus' final prayer, John chapter 17, before he goes to the cross, you know what his prayer was? And it was actually to us. He moves, he, he prays for the disciples and the apostles, and then he actually says, and I pray for the ones who come after them. He says, I pray that they will be one. As I and the Father are one. And why does he pray that? So that God would be glorified. So that people would know God. 
And I think the way that we're trying to fit God's word to defend what we think is creating the division that we have in our world and that we have in the body of Christ. And when we do this, we are doing the very thing the Sadducees were doing with the resurrection. And I'm not saying you shouldn't choose one or the other. We just have to realize sometimes a biblical text isn't telling someone to be a Democrat or a Republican. Those ideas weren't even in, 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 in the head of the biblical text. But we don't do this with just politics either, right? I hope I can say this. I'm a pastor. There's some stories in the Bible that I just don't like. Is that, is that okay? Like, I struggle with. I think, I think about Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, the early church. They lie about money, and then they're struck da- dead on the spot. I don't know what to do with that. Everything in me wants to say, wants to explain it away. We're not taking it as God's word and say, ah, that just accidentally slipped in there. Right? We sometimes pick and choose what we want to think and what we want to believe rather than taking the whole counsel of God's word. I think many of us, and it's me included, treat God's word and Jesus himself as consumers picking and choosing what we want God's word to say, like he's a buffet we eat from, rather than the truth that we stake our claim in. Right? We take God's word and we pick and choose what we want to think and what we want to prove, as opposed to saying, you know what, this is where I stake my claim, that it's true. So I want to ask us a question this morning. What version of Jesus are you choosing to follow? Is it the Jesus according to you? According to me? Is it the Jesus according to the world operating system? Or is it Jesus and his word according to a kingdom operating system? According to what Jesus says. And Jesus' response to the Sadducees shows them and it shows us that oftentimes we bring things like the resurrection or God's word and we try to fit it into our creaturely definitions. We try to fit it into our creaturely definitions understandings, when sometimes the kingdom operating system, God's word transcends that, and we're called to be an alternative witness. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're called to be different than the world. And I, and I want to pause here for a quick, I want to catch our breath a little bit. I want to pause here for a quick second, because the problem that Jesus states is that the Sadducees did not know the scriptures, but they had the first five books of the Bible memorized. So how they knew the scriptures, they had the scriptures memorized. So what I ask us is how can we make sure we know the scriptures? I think it's allowing the scriptures to move from our head into our heart, right? We've heard this before. We get this before. Here's what God's word says in Hebrews chapter four. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thought and intention of the heart. I think that verse summarizes what it means to know the scripture. Just even think about this. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, listen to this, and God's word discerns the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Have we allowed God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, to get into our heart, to root out our deepest fears, our deepest insecurities, our deepest and darkest sins and struggles, or have we allowed God just to stay at a distance? Because right? I think one of the reasons sometimes we, we let God's word stay up here but not travel down here into our heart is because we're fearful of what we may have to give up if we let God. Right? Because keeping God at a distance means God actually has to have access to your heart. Keeping God at a distance might provide more security than relying on him. Keeping God at a distance allows us to provide meaning for ourselves rather than God to provide meaning for us. And, and we may say, no, I'd rather rely on God. No, I want, 
to believe his word. No, I do not want to keep God in distance. And I believe that. I actually believe that is the heart of people in this church and the deepest longing of everybody in our world. Right? Scripture talks about how he set the eternity in the hearts of men. Right? There's something in every human, every person that, know, that longs for something more. And I believe that that is true. But I think sometimes we keep it a distance because honestly, when Jesus gets a hold of all of our heart, not just parts of our heart, he renovates it. He transforms it. He changes our desires. And we become, we want to serve. Because I think sometimes we keep it a distance because we're afraid, man, am I going to have to give a little more money to people in the church? Am I going to have to give up my time? Am I going to have to give up some more resources? What's God telling me to confess to somebody I've never confessed to? What's God asking of me in order to serve him and to be a part of the kingdom operating system as opposed to the worldly operating system? And I believe it is allowing God's word to permeate our hearts that will then lead us to see and experience God's power. That leads us to the, to the next part, right? Why, like the Sadducees, do we not know the scripture nor the power of God? The first answer, as we just unpacked, was we often mold and straight shape scripture to what we think rather than what God says. Here's the second one. Since we do not know what God says, we do not see and experience what God can do. Since we do not know what God says, we do not see and experience what God can do. Or we do not see God's power in our world. Right? In the text, Jesus now moves from showing the Sadducees to be wrong to proving the reality of the resurrection. And he quotes, he quotes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. This is, this is what he quotes. He says, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Jesus goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 3. And if you remember that text in scripture, it's when Moses was at the burning bush. Moses was at the burning bush. He was about to call Moses to set the Israelites free. It's the whole story where Moses asks, he's like, well, I don't know about you, God. Tell me your name. Right? And what does God say? I am. My name is I am. And so Jesus is quoting God here saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. I want you to notice the verb tense. It says, I am. It doesn't say, I was. Wait, aren't Abraham and Isaac and Jacob technically dead? I, I, yes, they have died, but they are alive. Jesus is saying, because of this verse, Sadducees, you should believe in a resurrection. Because I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am a God of the living, not the dead. And in the Old Testament, there's probably other verses that might prove the resurrection a little more, might refer to it a little more clearly. But again, the Sadducees only believe in the first five books of the Bible. So Jesus is going back to what they hold to be true. And what Jesus is saying is because of this verse, because of this verb tense, I am, you should believe in the resurrection and the power of God. But you know why the Sadducees missed it? Because they didn't know the scriptures. And why didn't they know the scriptures? Because they molded and shaped it to themselves. And so they could not see clearly. What's really interesting, this is a little side note. In verse 29, right, Jesus says, You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. That word know in the Greek means to know through observation, to see through observation, right? So that means if, if that understanding of knowing is to see through observation, if we are seeing through the lens of ourselves rather than the lens of scripture, we're going to see people who look like us, right? The Sadducees' failure to know scripture by forming and shaping it around them led to an inability to know and experience God's power in the resurrection. I think... An illustration might help. I had a boss one time when I was a little bit younger. Anyone had a boss that was just kind of scary? Maybe you have one now. You don't have to raise your hand. They may watch this. Or maybe they're here. Uh, right? But I had a boss who, who was kind of scary. And the only reason I really thought he was scary is because everyone told me he was scary. Right? It wasn't even because I had experienced that myself. But he was just 
he was kind of a man and just kind of distant and didn't really engage in conversation and just kind of, I was scared of him. I thought he was harsh, critical, but again, I didn't really know him. But then for whatever reason, the Lord put on my heart and was just like, you should pray for him. You should ask him if he needs prayer. I'm like, no, he doesn't need prayer. Um, right, so over a period of weeks, I, I, oh, I need to ask, I need to ask. I'm not going to, I'm really scared, I'm not gonna do it. Finally, I did it. And the Lord gave me courage and I said, hey, I just, I just want to ask if you need any prayer for anything, for you or for your family. And just through God's providence, actually somebody in his family had just been diagnosed with cancer. And so I was able to pray. But my experience with him in that conversation and asking him if he needed prayer, he was gentle. He was friendly. He was humble. He was grace-filled. He was overjoyed that I would ask if he needed prayer. And here's what I realized. Here's what I realized. Is that what I was told about him and believed about him led me to miss who he actually was. What I was told about him and believed about him led me to miss who he actually was. Because I was keeping him at a distance. Right? From my lack of experience... Right, kept him at a distance based on what my friends told me and what others told me. But then when I actually engaged him, I experienced someone totally different. And I think the same is true of God. If we mold and shape scripture around us rather than him, we will miss his power and what he's doing in the world. And not only that, when we mold and shape and create scripture and God that looks like us, and, and we put him in boxes that our world gives us and, and, and political parties and just ideas and anything else. When we put God in that box, we will get a God and we will experience a God who is like us. Let me say that again. When we mold, shape, and create scripture and a God who looks like us and believes like us, we will experience a God who is like us. We will experience a God who is finite. We will experience a God whose love is conditional. We will experience a God who, who saves based on what we do, the works that we get done. We will experience a God of limits, a God of death. We will experience a God who is no God at all. But when we allow Scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to permeate our heart, to move from our head to our heart and allow that to mold and shape and transform us into the image of God, we will experience God himself. We will experience a God who is infinite in power. We will experience a God whose love is unconditional with no strings attached. We will experience a God who saves based on what Jesus has done, not what we will do or are doing. We will experience a God of limitless grace. We will experience a God of abundant life. We will experience a God of deliverance, a God of the living. And I want us to know that all of these things, salvation, deliverance, restoration, renewal, healing, those are not things that just happened at the cross. And they're not just things that we can hope for in the future. Those things, deliverance, renewal, healing, wisdom, all of these things are things me and you can experience right now. And I want to say experience. I'm using the word experience because I think we, and I went to Dort, and I am, I am all about the Reformed faith and Reformed theology, but we're, we got the head stuff down. We're really, really good at that. And I love it. And if we want to talk about theology and debate, I, I enjoy that. But where we need to grow, where I need to grow, is moving that into my heart. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. But here's the reality. God is always the God of the living. Right? That's what Jesus is saying in this text. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of the living. And it's not just the God of the living in the past, but he's the God of us right now. God's saving presence is always with his people.
I just realized as I was preaching, I, I didn't read my initial renewing the covenant that I was planning to in Jeremiah chapter 30. But if we were to go back to Jeremiah chapter 30, what God is doing in that text, basically he's saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's it. He's saying, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob. I will heal your land. I will bring you back to the place. I will bring you out of exile. I will deliver you. And if we were to summarize, here, you take this, this one's good. If you were to summarize all of scripture in one sentence, this is how I would do it. I will be your God and you will be my people. God saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. That is the story of scripture. That is, that is the story of a God of the living who is saying to you and to me right now as we're in this room, I am your God. And you are my child. I am your God and you are my daughter. I am your God and you are my son. I am your God and I will deliver you from whatever you're going through. I am your God and I will forgive whatever sin is covered up. I am your God and I will restore your fortunes. I will, I will renew your heart. I will transform you and make you into me even more. Why? So that the world will know me. So that the world will have life. So that all of the world will know that God is a God of the living. That his active, saving presence will be with all people. The text ends as we conclude here in verse 33. And the crowd heard it, and they were astonished at his teaching. I hope we are astonished this morning. Not astonished at me. Not as astonished as anybody in this room, but that we are astonished at the scriptures and God's power. That we are astonished that God is a God of the living. And my hope and my challenge to us this week, if we were to take something away from this, something to do this week. It, it, I mean, in some ways it's simple. I want you to read God's word. Would you read God's word this week? Would, would you, and not just read it, but would you believe it? It doesn't matter where you start. The book of John's great. Psalms are great. Open up randomly. Ezekiel 12, right? right? But read and believe God's word. And let God's word permeate your heart to draw out your hurts, your fears, your insecurities, your sins. Whatever is going on in your life, it's been a weird year. 2020 is a weird year. But allow God to draw those things out. And here's what I know. That when we truly know and understand the scriptures, meaning the Holy Spirit has put them in our heart, we will experience God's saving presence right now. Where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. Because God is God of the living, not the dead. Our God redeems, our God, our God restores, our God renews, our God transforms, our God delivers, our God heals, our God resurrects. That's what he does. That's who he is. That's what he desires for us as his people. And so a knowledge of the scripture leads us to a knowledge and experience of God's power. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Lebanon Christian Reformed Church. God, and I pray this week that we would read your word and that you, by the power of your spirit, would just invade our hearts. Lord, that we would be changed and transformed into your image, be more like your son. And as a result, may we begin to see your power, experience your power, but then begin to see it in the world. Why? So that you would be glorified. So that the world may know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, man. Stand as we, maybe? Yeah, I indicate stand. May stand as we worship.
give us a blessing as we go into our song of ascending, but also just before that, as we go out, um, the offering in the back, and I know we're not passing it because of COVID and all of those things, and today's offering is for the 11 on budget, which is always good to support the church, but also the Ireton debts. And so may you receive this blessing from the Lord. I want to read from us from a little bit from Psalm 19 and, and send us out. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And so Lebanon Christian Reformed Church, may God's perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true word permeate your heart this week and open you up our God's power. You go in peace.